So Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 through 12 says this. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which is not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Good morning, Living Rock Church. We're glad you could join us for worship as we're trying this online worship service out. I got a couple of announcements for you all. Uh, most of our activities have been canceled, but we still have men's and women's Bible study going on this week and a couple of updates to how those are going to work out. And so the women's Bible study is meeting Monday at 6 p.m. and they're actually going to be doing a conference call. And so at the end of the service, we're going to have a couple of announcement slides up. And one of those is going to have a number which you can dial on Monday night. And that'll give you an access code that'll bring you into that 6 p.m. conference call for women's Bible study. As far as the men's Bible study goes, they're still meeting, same place as last week, same time. And so that'll be at 7 p.m. out here at the church office, and that's on Tuesday night. So 7 p.m. Tuesday night out here at the office. Student ministry, a little bit of a change to our schedule. So we didn't we weren't supposed to have a meeting this Wednesday, but since we couldn't last week. We're going to be doing our first ever live stream 180. And so that's happening Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Uh, for students, I'm going to be sending out a, a link uh, via our group chat. You can also find that on Facebook. And that will allow you to get into the, the live, chat, live chat when it opens up at 7 p.m. And so again, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Uh, live stream 180 service. It's going to be great. Hope, hope you can be there. Hope you can make it for that. Finally, why don't we have our ushers come forward? We can't do that, actually. We can't have ushers come forward. But if you did want to give, we've got two ways to do that. So you can either do it through our app or through the website. And we've got a, tab, a giving tab on both of those. And so if you go there, that will direct you uh, to our Tithely Giving resource. And that will allow you to give online, even though we can't do it in person. And so check both of those out. Now would you join me in, in a quick word of prayer before we go into our, 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 our Sunday morning message. So Father, man, I'm so thankful for technology and uh, especially right now how it's a allowing us to, to still uh, be connected even when we're not together. And so I just pray this morning that our, our worship would be would be genuine, would be authentic, and that, uh, most importantly, you would speak through your word. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hi, I'm Kathy Sutherland. I'm the Children's Ministry Director here at Living Rock. And I am really missing the children running in with smiles on their face to come check in at, at Cornerstone Kids um, and also the team of volunteers because we meet at 845 every Sunday morning. Um, we get to um, hang out and, and just share life together and, and pray for each other and for our, for our children. Um, and I just, I know these days are challenging. Um, I know my faith has been stretched and, and strengthened um, and I hope yours has too. And I know many of you are homeschooling for the first time. Um, I remember those years. I homeschooled for several years. My kids are all grown up. But one of my fondest memories uh, with homeschooling is we would have is the mornings because we didn't have to run out the door. Um, now I'm working and you know rushing out the door. But um, I just remember those times where we had our family devotion time together where we could pray and um, read the Bible together and I still think of those days um, now that my kids are all grown up and I just uh, just want to encourage you to invest in that in that family devotional time um, now that you're home and your kids are all home you're all the whole family's home um, you will not regret that time um, and if you don't have that family devotional time you you will find that your kids time flies by and your kids are 
before you know it, they're growing up and they're out of the house. And um, so just don't miss that opportunity. Um, perhaps you'll establish a new routine in your family with them all, all home. And um, so that's what my prayer is for you. Um, and I don't want you to miss out on that, that treasure time together. Um, I have some uh, resources um, that I wanted to share. This is, this is a family devotional that I picked up at uh, Alliance uh, Council a couple, three years ago. And there's an Old Testament and a New Testament book. What I like about this book is it's for preschool all the way up to high school because we know we have all the ages together at home. And it's funny and it just, it really brings the scripture to life. So this is a resource you could use for devotions. There's Old Testament, New Testament. Um, many of you might have devotional books that you bought over the years and they might, might be on your shelf. Well, this is the time to take them off, dust them off and actually use them. Um, so yeah, just wanna encourage you on that. Um, also, uh, been talking with Diane Hofek and she has come up with some really fun um, kids opportunities that we can do. Um, and so be watching on Facebook, uh, probably an announcement on Monday. She'll have a video announcement uh, just with a, a great idea with uh, working with the kids remotely where you're at and putting something together. Um, so just be looking for that and you can get back to Diane on that. Um, I will be connecting, uh, giving a call to all of the families and volunteers within Cornerstone Kids. And I just wanna check in and see if there's anything that we can do for you at Living Rock. Um, also wanna be praying for you and wanna know what your prayers, your prayer requests are. I wanna know how to pray for you. So I'll be doing that in the upcoming next two weeks. And so if you wanna reach out to me before that, please feel free to do that. Um, I just want to leave you with my thoughts on this uh, better study book that I have been doing. I've just come to cherish this, uh, this study in Hebrews. I've never actually studied Hebrews this deeply. And what I'm finding is um, a lot of it applies to my life and what I'm actually walking through these last two months. And I just want to share um, my thoughts. I just want to share a, a verse that uh, really spoke to my heart this week. And it's uh, out of Hebrews 7. 25. Actually, I'll read 24 and 25. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequent, consequently, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for him, for all of us. And I just, this really spoke to my heart because um, Jesus is able to fully, fully save us from now to eternity and he lives at the right hand of God and what really encouraged me is that that God that Jesus is praying for us he's living at the right hand of God and he's praying for us continually and just think Jesus is praying for all of us always every day all day and right now even as we speak he's Jesus is praying amen Well, welcome everyone to our Living Rock Church worship service. We're glad you can join us today. Uh, we've been working through the book of Hebrews. I've really enjoyed uh, walking through the book of Hebrews these last several weeks. And what I've noticed is a lot of repetition. And you see that in some of the words that keep repeating themselves over and over again in the book. Uh, some words in Hebrews appear more than any other place in the New Testament. Words like sacrifice, that's 18 times in Hebrews, more than any other book in the New Testament. Words like covenant, that's 16 times. Priest, 34 times, more than any other time in the New Testament. And then the word salvation, that appears more in Hebrews than any other book in the New Testament, seven times. And the word promise is there 17 times. And we can't forget the word that keeps showing up over and over again. That word is better. It's, it's in the book 12 times. So now we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to be reading sections of it today. And there's another key word that shows up over and over again. And it's the word blood. And all through Hebrews, the word blood is there 20 times. And it's 
hear a lot in Hebrews chapter 9, so also is the word tabernacle because for the Hebrew mindset, knowing the Old Testament and the tabernacle, blood and tabernacle kind of go together. Blood and tabernacle. And you'll see that as we go through this chapter. I could maybe say we're going to read through one of the bloodiest chapters in the New Testament because it's all about the blood and the tabernacle. So that's what we're going to look at today. Let me uh, show you the outline. The outline in Hebrews 9 is going to be pictures of the tabernacle, verses 1 to 5, then provisions in the tabernacle, what went on there, what kind of activity went on there, verses 6 and 7. And then the problems with the tabernacle, and that's verses 8 to 10. And then, and then the better part we've been waiting for, which is that this perfection in the heavenly tabernacle, verse 11, really to the end of the chapter. So let's begin by working our way through uh, the book. So I'm going to read uh, verses 1 to 5, and we'll get a picture of, of this earthly tabernacle. It says, The first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room were a lampstand, a table, and the sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the Holy Place. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was the second room called the Most Holy Place. In that room were a gold incense altar, a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark were a gold jar containing manna, Aaron's staff sprouted with leaves, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. That's the Ten Commandments. Above the ark were the cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the ark's cover, the place of atonement, or we know it as the mercy seat. And then he says, but we cannot explain these things in detail now. <laughs> Maybe that's because the Hebrews grew up with all of this. They knew all about what went on at the tabernacle. Or maybe it's because there's 50 chapters in the Old Testament all about the tabernacle and the services there, and it's just too much to get into. Or maybe it's because he just wants to talk about the earthly tabernacle just enough to get them thinking about the new heavenly tabernacle, which is what the author of Hebrews is trying to do, show them something better now in Christ. So now, we probably don't know that much about the tabernacle, so here's a picture uh, of the tabernacle I grabbed off the internet. And it shows the outer court, and then this is the tabernacle proper uh, inside here. But this outer court was uh, 150 feet long and 75 feet wide, and this was the entrance right here on this end. It was about a quarter size of a football field, if you can imagine that in your mind. And here's the bronze altar. This is where they would sacrifice the animals. Here's a uh, uh, labor where they would uh, wash their hands. Just the priests would wash their hands. And this thing was, get this, this thing was made out of the mirrors that they got from Egypt, from the Egyptian lady. So that, that's kind of cool. And then this is actually the tabernacle proper. It had an entrance, a curtain, uh, into the holy place. And then on the, on the back was the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could enter once a year on the Day of Atonement. And that was, uh, there was also a curtain there separating that place. So this is 45 feet long. It's 15 feet high, and it's 15 feet wide. But the Holy of Holies is a perfect cube. It's 15 by 15 by 15. And the walls inside the Holy of Holies, except for the curtain, are covered in gold, solid gold. In fact, everything inside 
is gold, purple, uh, scarlet, uh, blue. It's just beautiful inside the tabernacle. The covering was uh, linen. One covering was linen. Two coverings of animals. And then some people think that outer covering was actually seal skin. And you'd think, yeah, that would hold up pretty well uh, outside as they traveled in the wilderness. So just imagine the Levites back in the day picking all this stuff up, tearing all this stuff down, carrying it around as they traveled in the wilderness. And, and what was the point of all of it? Was it just to have the first portable church? Well, maybe, but... The real point was God said, I want to dwell with my people. I, I want to be with them. And so this was put in the midst of the camp of Israel because God would lead them, he would provide for them, he would bring them into his promises and into his rest. Now Hebrew says all of this is pointing to uh, a Christology. This is a typology pointing to a Christology not because we're just imagining it, but because the New Testament says so. This is a picture of Christ, and that's what we're going to see today as we go through the message. So the second part uh, of the outline is provisions in the tabernacle. This is where we'll talk about some of the things that went on there. I'm going to begin reading again in verse 6. Uh, when these things were all in place, that's the tabernacle furnishings, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties, but only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year, and he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people, the ones they had committed in ignorance. So, uh, it doesn't tell us a whole lot here what went on there, but really verse 7 we know is talking about the, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, when God covered the sins of Israel. So I want to just walk you through what happened on the Day of Atonement. So I, I have to show you uh, this sketch of the interior of the tabernacle, and uh, let's talk about what happened there. So if you read in Leviticus 16, it, it tells us what Aaron the high priest did on the Day of Atonement. And the first place you would see him is out here at the altar. He would be dressed in his white linens, his white headdress, his white robe, his white sash, white shorts, representing his holiness and purity. And the first thing that he had to do was bring a young bull and a ram to this altar and he would sacrifice that bull and that was for his own sin and the sins of his family so that's the first thing that would happen on the day of atonement then the people would bring two goats and a ram and one goat was selected to be sacrificed here at the altar the high priest would do that and then the blood was collected, so you had blood from uh, the young bull for Aaron, and you had blood from the goat for the people. And then some underneath here, the uh, utensils were used to collect some of the hot coals, and then incense. So all of that stuff, those four things were brought into the Holy of Holies. So the high priest would take all of that, through the holy place, and then back into the Holy of Holies. Now, the first thing he would do when he got into the Holy of Holies is he would take the incense and he would put it over the burning coals to fill that room with smoke. Now, some people think that's because it was for his protection because no one can see the Lord and live. And so if you fill the room with smoke, maybe Aaron will be safe and he'll come out of the Lord's presence alive, which was always a concern, by the way. Will he ever come out alive? And then the next thing he would do is he would take some of the blood from the bull 
and seven times sprinkle it on the mercy seat. That's the cover of the ark. And then he would take some of the blood from the goat, which was for the people, and he would sprinkle that seven times on the mercy seat of the ark. And then uh, he would take the blood and he would sprinkle it for the inside of the tabernacle seven times. Then he would come out to the altar of incense here and he would put bull's blood and goat blood on all four corners and then sprinkle that seven times. Um, this is all, all part of the atonement process to, to cover our sins as we have trans, transgressed against the Lord and we need his mercy. Then it, Aaron would go back to the courtyard here because um, there is still another goat out here. And that goat we know as the scapegoat. And he would lay both hands on the head of this goat and he would confess the sins of Israel. And then it says the Lord would transfer the sins of the nation onto the goat. And someone was designated then to take that goat way out of the camp, far, far away from everyone, out into the wilderness, never to be seen again. So all of this is just a picture of what God does to cover and remove our sin from us. Then the last thing we see Aaron doing is he goes back into the holy place. There he has to take off his white inner garments, which probably aren't white anymore. They're probably bloody. He has to take those off. He has to wash. He puts on new undergarments. He puts on his priestly garments. You know, all of the colorful, the, the bells, the gold, the jewels. And he appears to the people, which the people are relieved because he's alive. And everything must have gone good between us and the Lord that day, and he finishes up the uh, burnt offerings here, which I think was just a gigantic barbecue. That might have been the fun part of the whole day. What's the result of all this? Levi, um, Levi, Levi's sitting right here, by the way. I just, <laughs> Leviticus, <laughs> Leviticus 16.30. We'll keep that in. That was kind of funny <laughs> on that day offerings of purification will be made for you and you will be purified in the Lord's presence from all your sins that was the big goal of the day of atonement that's why all the blood that's why all the prescription specific blood administered in a specific way blood 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 sprinkled everywhere so now, what's the problem? Well, let's keep reading. The third uh, part of this chapter is problems with the tabernacle, and let's just read about a couple of them here in verses 8, starting in verse 8. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time for the gifts and sacrifices that the priest offered are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. There's that word better again. So these verses mention a couple problems with this tabernacle system. One is the people still aren't free to go into the presence of the Lord. There's still a gigantic no trespassing sign. Don't come in here or you're dead. And But the high priest could go in once a year for a few minutes and that was it. So that doesn't sound like we're really in the Lord's presence at all. And the second problem is the, these sacrifices, they didn't cleanse anyone's conscience. Everybody was sprinkled on the outside. Everything sprinkled on the outside, but 
Where's the change of heart that we desperately need? Where's the change on the inside? Well, there is a better tabernacle with better blood that is needed. That takes us to the next section, which is about the perfection of the heavenly tabernacle. Now, this discussion begins in uh, verse 11 and really to the end of the chapter. Let me read just a few verses here. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. For he has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once for all time, and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ, this is verse 14, I think we have a slide for this. This is a very key verse in this chapter. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences. That, that's the deep need of, of, of human beings right there. A clear conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God, for by the power of the eternal Spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. We've got a better tabernacle in heaven because we've got better blood. Remember, Blood and tabernacle go together. Did you see in this verse here, you've got the involvement of the whole Trinity. This is a, a Trinitarian verse because you've got the living God, you've got the sacrifice of the Son, you've got the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit provide the blood, apply the blood. We need to purify our consciences and secure our salvation for how long? Forever. The only thing the earthly tabernacle could do was cover you for a year. And, and it all had to be redone over and over and over again. And then, you know, that tabernacle lasted about 400 years. And then it was gone. And I think what this author of Hebrews is doing is helping these Jewish people who are wondering if they should come to Christ. Remember, I think this was written about 65 AD. We're five years away from the temple being destroyed. There won't be anything going on at the temple anymore. Something better needs to come along uh, for the Hebrew people so their sins can be cleansed, and it is the blood of Christ. So the high priest in his earthly tabernacle, he was, can I say, he was a human sprinkler. He's sprinkling blood, animal blood everywhere. Year after year, on the outside of everything, Jesus is the better high priest. He offers his own blood. And remember at the Last Supper, when he said, this is my, my blood, did he sprinkle it on the disciples? seven times no he said drink and that's an indication that he would do a deep cleansing deep inside of us i want to read a quote from john piper in his book passion uh, of jesus christ i want to thank uh, joyce parker for re reminding me of this quote this week and he said the only answer in these modern times, as in other times, is the blood of Christ. When our conscience rises up and condemns us, where will we turn? We turn to Christ. We turn to the suffering and death of Christ, the blood of Christ. This is the only cleansing agent in the universe that can give the conscience relief in life and peace in death. Now I'm going to close our service today and I want to pray for everyone and I've got one more quote that I want to show 
and it's by J.C. Ryle. And he says, you know, the older saints talked a lot about the blood of Christ. I don't know if you've heard of anybody talking about the blood of Christ recently. Maybe we should talk more about it. And how is it applied to our lives for our forgiveness, for hope, eternal life, and hope in death? J.C. Ryle said, The blood of Christ can cleanse away all sin, but we must plead guilty before God can declare us innocent. And so, how do we get the blood applied to us? We repent of our sins. We acknowledge our guilty consciences. And we bow to him and say, Jesus, please forgive me. Apply your life in exchange for my life. Take my death, pour your new life into me, and you will receive eternal life and hope in this world. Can you think of anything more that we need right now than hope? I mean, we're so afraid of some microscopic thing that is killing people. And in a few months and years that will pass, but there is a larger problem and that is sin. Sin always kills and we need a cure. And that cure is not in this world. No scientist will find it. That cure is the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure glad that the blood of Christ has been applied to my life, and I hope the blood of Jesus has been applied to you as well. Receive his work, his perfect sacrifice, and his once-for-all salvation offered for you. So let me pray, and then we're going to finish our time together. Father in heaven, I want to thank you again for Jesus. And thank you for that phrase, his once for all sacrifice. One time he hung on the cross for us. And his blood applied to us when we put our faith in him, when we believe in him. That blood applies to us forever. That blood brings us into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. That blood cleanses us once for all time. And, and we eagerly await for the Son of God to appear again and finish uh, our salvation, which has only begun. We've only begun with the salvation story. You intend to glorify us and remake this world in a new heaven and earth and once again walk with people in this world. So I pray that everyone watching today would have this hope, would know the cleansing power of God through Christ, and I pray that they would be blessed and be reminded that one day, we're all going to die at some point, and something will happen, but we can have hope in death, and that hope is in Jesus Christ. So we thank you for this time. Thank you for the word of God we've just read. Thank you that it can feed our soul and strengthen us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I just want to say thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the ministry of this uh, tape that we've made and we will see you next week we'll be doing this for a while and if there's anything we can do for you to pray for you uh, at, in this time please contact the Living Rock Church office at livingrockchurch.com and uh, we'd be glad to help you and pray for you we'll see you soon